candidate for the leadership of the Provincial Liberal Party. Um, I, I, I'm merely giving a lecture about one of the greatest liberals and arguably one of the greatest islanders in the history of the province. Uh, so I, I, I did need to get that out of the way right at the beginning there. Catherine Dewar was asking me if I'd state my politics. Thank God for the secret ballot. Uh, this is a little bit awkward for me to give this talk. Um, I know just my topic to agree to give the lecture, but not enough to avoid having my ignorance exposed uh, by the audience. And so I think one of the things I'd like to do is, uh, if anyone here uh, has comments or information to offer, I, I'm looking at the audience and I see one of my mentors and profs, an Irish expert, Brendan O'Grady here, Jim Keown, I was just out to your school the other day there, half the Keowns, I mean half the school were Keowns, and they all had a project in the Heritage Fair, and uh, they all seem to have an act for research. So if you have any uh, information to offer after the talk about family legends, about Edward Whelan, um, about his relationship with the Irish on Prince Edward Island, or if you have records in your family file, letters from Edward Whelan, uh, artifacts, mementos. The island needs those because, uh, for reasons that I'll explain, very little of Edward Whelan's legacy, in a physical sense, survives. He has been the creature of tragedy. So, the one other right I was going to make that is, uh, if I screw up this lecture, uh, uh, it is the basis for an article in the Island Magazine published in the last issue, or that, that article is the basis for the lecture. Um, I have a few overheads. Uh, as Grant knows, Grant shares in one of my classes, and uh, I'm addicted to overheads now. So I started out being addicted to slides so I could turn the lights out when I talked, and people would be looking at pictures instead of at me. And now I'm addicted to overheads uh, because I'm Scottish and they cost less than slides to make. So, actually, I'm not entirely Scottish. George didn't mention that on my mother's side of the family, I'm, I'm actually pretty Irish. The uh, the lecture I'm going to give. My point of entry into Edward Whalen, I've been doing island history for a long time, but my point of entry into Edward Whalen is a little pack of letters that were uncovered originally at the public archives in Halifax, where they had been put on deposit by the archivist, who was at that time an islander, uh, who's a Harvey, actually. And uh, they are among the very few surviving letters written by Whelan, and they concern an election campaign that was about to take place. And unfortunately, we only have letters partly through the campaign, but they opened a, a fascinating window on the Edward Whelan, the political warfare of the 1860s, and his relationship with his constituency. And by that I mean not only the electors in his riding, but his real community, the constituency, the Catholic Irish of Prince Edward Island. And I wasn't meaning for you to have to read this. Edward Whalen was always in a hurry. And I don't know whether he won awards for you know, writing when he was in school in Halifax for penmanship, but it takes a while to decipher his writing. So. You can, you can work on that. Uh, one of the curious things about his letters, these are to his running mate, and he can't spell the guy's name right. He, he keeps spelling it Clark with an E, Clark without an E, and I think it's because he was in a hurry. My topic, of course, then, is Edward Whalen. 
And what I'd like to do this evening is explore his relationship with the Irish and the island through the prism of the critical event in his life, the first and only time that he lost an election. And I posed the title, George didn't need the title, he's asking me for a title and I had agreed to do the talk and I, I couldn't think of anything catchy and um, I was talking or thinking about his relationship with the Irish and PI and the questions surrounding it and I finally came up with a love gone bad. Um, but I posed it as a question because I'm not confident of the answer to that question. First of all, did in fact the relationship between Edward Whalen and the island Irish go sour? And if it did go sour, what was the reason for that? Was it a failing in Whalen or was it a failing in the electors? By the way, I'm going to pronounce his name Edward Whalen because all of the Whalens and PEI that I know from New Zealand and whatnot are Whalens. Perhaps the greatest living expert on Edward is Ian Ross Robertson who insists on referring to him as Edward Whelan. I differ with Ian on that score. While I admire greatly his work on Whelan and what I've done this evening owes a great deal to his work on Whelan, which you can see in a profile that he wrote in the DCB uh, many years ago. But Whelan makes it sound like someone asked Edward Whelan his name and someone grabbed him while he was trying to answer. <laughs> and my name's Edward Whelan. Um, these letters then were my point of entry, Ian Ross Robertson, the newspapers, and about now 25 years of muddling around in island history provided the background for the talk. And I think I've probably spent enough time talking about the background of the talk. Probably no figure in island history has been the subject of so much romantic legend as Edward Whalen. Not only legend, but romantic legend and I mean there's a picture of him there uh, all of the images of Whalen appear to come from the same source sometimes they are turned one way or the other here's the image I'm using this evening because it's a new image to me this is an engraving of Edward Whalen that appeared with a collection of speeches that he had made, given during the course of his lifetime, collected by one of his admirers, Mr. McCourt. Uh, and the reason I put the picture down at the bottom is because I actually did want to show you. I mean, who else but Edward Whalen in the history of PEI would have a poetic eulogy written for him by Thomas Darcy McGee? I mean, the Irish poet politician, visionary, and architect of Canada thought highly enough of Edward Whalen that he published a poem in his memory. And that's just one of the verses. That's, in fact, the last verse. Darcy McGee, by the way, and Edward Whalen have a lot in common. Um, and if we had a lot of time and if you're coming back to class next week, see, I can always, it doesn't matter if I finish my lectures in class because I say, well, we'll pick up on this, you know, Monday. If we look selectively at Edward Whalen's career, it is stopped by tragedy, in death as in life. He was married twice, his first wife died, so he was a widower for a time. Of his children, only one survived to adulthood. He died young. He was only 43, and since I'm now, I'm now 45, I think that's particularly young. He was unquestionably brilliant. I mean, you cannot have tragedy, real tragedy, with the mediocre. I mean, for you... For, for, for you to have a really good tragedy, the person has to have talent or they had to have been special. 
Allen unquestionably was special. He was a brilliant writer and journalist. According to Ian Robertson, and I have seen nothing in my research to refute this, perhaps the most talented newspaper journalist in the history of PEI, and that was certainly the judgment of journalists writing in the early 1900s after the golden age had passed on in journalism. He was, in his day, the most polished, the most attractive orator on Prince Edward Island, a stump speaker who could pass from, from eloquence to invective with the, all the ease of drinking a pint of Guinness. That's not in my notes, that just occurred to me. I was looking at Darren Peters here for something, I don't know what, sorry Darren. He was also a political leader of insight and intelligence and cunning. You don't succeed in politics without cunning. And so to have that brilliance cut short is the stuff of tragedy. His death was unkind to him. And we'll talk a bit about his death. Uh, according to the romantic legend, he died of a broken heart. Not broken by some woman, but broken by his true love, the people that he felt he had embraced and had embraced him. But consider this. He was a man of letters. A man known first and foremost for his words. After his death, within a decade, there was a fire in his house and all of his personal library and papers were lost. That's why letters such as the one I put up are rare. That's why I'm canvassing you if you have letters written by Whalen, um, their little treasures, and should be copied for the public archives, at least. His only surviving son, who survived to adulthood, drowned in a freak accident boating out here in the harbor a few days after he graduated from college, having won a number of prizes. So the announcement of the prizes appeared almost at the same time as the announcement of his death. Even the occasional campaigns to commemorate Edward Whalen and enshrine him in the posterity PI came unhinged. And at least two occasions campaigns were mounted to raise money to build him a statue. Now, I don't have to bring up monuments and statues in this room. Um, you know how hard it is to finance that kind of thing. Both times fell short. There would be, and there still is, no statue to commemorate Edward Whalen. The very fact that I know of no other campaign by anyone on Prince Edward Island to build a statue to anybody else, except possibly Anna Green Gables, who, if she were real, was from Nova Scotia, not from PEI. He has lived on, though. The very building we're standing in is named after Edward Whalen. There is a room in the Coles building called the Whalen Room, and I, you have to make sure you read the nameplate because sometimes when you hear what goes on in there, you think it's like the whale on the wall. Um, but he does live on the folklore of Prince Edward Island. That's why his name became legend in part. There are stories told about him, stories told about his wit, stories told about the prodigious talent that he showed, stories told about his death. And we're going to look at his death. I have here, uh, are scrambling so badly to complete this you know, lecture. In 1906, he was voted third most famous islander of all time in a newspaper poll. Admittedly, uh, the vote was low, the turnout was low, but not bad for someone who had been dead for 40 years. The outstanding islanders of that day were current, or the other two people ahead of him on the poll tended to be current Islanders. It was a liberal newspaper. It may have influenced the vote. And considering that supposedly he had been rejected by the very people that had made him an icon, that's not bad. J. H. Fletcher, not Irish and not a Catholic, is from down in Pawnall, in his own day a famous newspaper editor and a, a political leader in the United States. 
grew up believing that Edward Whalen was the greatest man that lived on the island. He wrote, and I am still of the same opinion, in the early 1900s. He was J.H. Fletcher's hero, and there's much of the hero in Edward Whalen, I think. But there is also much that is compellingly human, and that's the true essence of tragedy. And that's why we come back to Edward Whalen. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole long lecture about his career. That would take at least two lectures. A very brief synopsis, if you will. He was born in Ireland, County Mayo, I think, um, in 1824. Obscure origins. His father may have been a soldier in the British infantry. Um, that's handled in a, a discreet fashion. His mother may have been a widow at the time that she came out to Halifax in 1831, when Edward Whalen was seven. By the age of eight, he had been apprenticed to Joseph Howe, a name to conjure with in the history of Canada, the greatest newspaper editor of his day, uh, one of the champions of making governments responsible, one of the great figures in Canadian history, and he taught Edward Whalen the ropes. By the age of 18, Whalen was a newspaper editor in Halifax, a newspaper called The Register, I think. By the age of 19, he had come to Charlottetown to establish a paper, a newspaper. 19 years old, he wasn't just going to edit a newspaper, he would be the proprietor, publisher, and editor. It shows a certain precociousness, I think. After a couple of a couple of false starts in 1847, he founded his most enduring monuments. And if you're looking for Edward Whalen's words, you're not going to find them in his letters. You're going to find them in the pages of the newspaper he founded, which for many years was the leading newspaper on Prince Edward Island, The Examiner. Already by that time, in 1846, at the age of 22, Robert Gish should take note of this. He had been elected to the House of Assembly for the writing of Second Kings, which includes, actually I have an overhead of that, don't I? The big thing about overhead is you fill in gaps. Here is the Second Kings, St. Peter's writing. The boundaries of the writing changed over time uh, with electoral uh, reform in 1893. In the 1860s, the writing comprised lots 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, and lot 56. So there's a, a swath of island land extending from the head of the Hillsborough River through Morel, Magell, Marie, St. Peter's, along the Fortune Road, including the north side, ending up in Fortune, Whalen's Fortune. There is an account in the newspaper of Edward Whalen's victory, and he was hoisted on the shoulders of his followers and carried down the road alongside the bay to music and song. It was a little bit easier to carry him on your shoulders. He was not a very big man, and I think as a young man he was probably not as heavy as in the photographs that we see of him. So here you have him. By the age of 23, he's a politician in the House of Assembly, and he's a newspaper owner and editor. And he's going to be brilliant at both of those. Over the next four years, the party that he helps to form. And part of the understanding of Edward Whalen's faith involves understanding the party system on Prince Edward Island, which, which was embryonic, if you will, still in the 1840s and the 50s. There was a reform camp on Prince Edward Island, which is going to slowly coalesce into something called the Liberal Party. There is a Tory or status quo element in island life which is going to coalesce into a conservative party. And at that time, the ideology of those parties was less 
important as a glue than issues and identities such as your ethnicity, your religion, your position on key issues. The Liberal Party was the party of political reform. It was the party under George Coles, a self-taught, self-educated, self-made man, a brewer and a distiller, and I have to give a lecture about that at the end of March. Um, Edward Whalen was George Cole's strongest ally. They were a team. George Coles was the respectable Anglican who could deliver the moderate Protestant vote, and Edward Whalen was the eloquent, fiery Catholic who could deliver and did deliver the Irish Catholic vote to the Liberal Party during the key struggle for control of the Assembly and the key struggle to convince the Colonial Office in London that Islanders were big enough and mature enough to be able to run their government themselves, to make government responsible. That is, for the executive branch of government, the cabinet, I hope you're taking notes on this, it'll be in the test, for the cabinet to be comprised of people who were members of the party which held a majority in the elected house. They were not appointed, they were members of the majority party elected by Islanders. Edward Whalen was part of that government which George Coles established. The government PI, you know, responsible government was granted in 1851. A number of important acts were passed by the government of which Whalen was a leading member, including free education for Islanders, the first place in British North America to grant free education because education is power, and education empowers the poor, empowers the downtrodden, and Whalen very much identified with those people. They passed uh, uh, an act to purchase back from the large-scale landowners the great estates um, into which the island had been split up and divided. Eventually, politics being what it is, uh, the Liberals were put out of office and Edward Whalen passed into opposition. He had, he had been and continued to be a defender of both his race and a defender of his religion. He was a Catholic. He was not, I think, what one would call a fervent Catholic, but when the politics of Prince Edward Island turn to the manipulation of religion to alienate the voting blocks on Prince Edward Island. Essentially what happened was the Conservative Party, seeking a way back into office, chose, well they recognized that the island was split into two camps. Among other camps, there were two camps, the Catholics and the Protestants. The Catholics were the largest single group, but the Protestants were a majority. And if you could convince the Protestants to vote as a bloc, then they would hold a majority, and there was a manipulation, quite a deliberate one, of fears, religious fears among Protestants and Catholics, one of the other, in order for the Conservatives to lever the Liberals out of office and themselves back in, and it worked. It worked so well in 1858 and 59 that they did it again in 1868. It was a very poor performance. So at the time that our story starts, Edward Whalen is in opposition. Our story starts in 1866. And there's an election coming up. The Conservatives have been in power since 1859. They have to call a general election soon. There's also a by-election meeting to be called in Second Kings because one of the two members of the riding died, John Sutherland who I presume is the Sutherlands who still live in Greenwich. John Sutherland was a Protestant. It is a mixed riding, and those of, um, I think most of you here don't need to have this explained, as it's been long tradition on Prince Edward Island, broken only in recent years. Um, 
not to oppose Protestant and Catholic at elections, but in 1866 that nicety had yet to be worked out in a gentleman's agreement. But their dual ridings on Prince Edward Island, and so this riding will elect two members. And because it's a mixed riding, it's generally conceded that one of them will be a Protestant and one of them will be a Catholic. It is okay in those days for a member not to live in the riding they represent. It's usually felt that one of the two members should reside in the riding. If one of them does, it's okay for the other not to, because Edward Whelan is not from St. Peter's, and he's not from Morrell, and he's not from Morrell Rear, the back settlement. I love Morrell Rear. I don't know why they changed it to Green Meadows. It's just... There's a certain innuendo to a name like Morrell Rear. But in any case, he lives in Charlottetown, represents his riding from a distance. I had begun my research thinking, because our relatives in Morrell, that Morrell is essentially an Irish place. I mean, is there anybody here from Morrell? Yeah. Are there any Irish people in Morrell? Connollys and Phelans and O'Briens and Dunns and Maguire, like Connell, yeah, it's like, you can't, Larkin, I guess they're more from St. Peter's, you can't turn around without running into an Irish person in Morrell. But this writing actually, uh, if you look, I have another overhead that I'm probably not going to use. Well, this is uh, an overhead from Andrew Hill Clark's famous book on the geography of Prince Edward Island. And if you look at the bottom map, it's predominant of origin of people by townships. And you may not be able to read this because it's been a while um, that the overhead was related to a book. But in most of Edward Whelan's writing, the predominant ethnic origin is Scottish. Once you get to the bay and beyond, along the north side, Cable Head, Goose River, Monticello, you're into a heavily Highland Scottish, although Catholic, Scottish area. In Morrell, head of the Hillsborough River, there is a mixed Irish, English, and Scottish sort of population. So it's not an overwhelmingly Irish riding, but it is an overwhelmingly Catholic riding with significant pockets of Protestants, particularly residing in the area between Morrell and the Bay at St. Peter's. So this is the riding Edward Whelan has held by 1866 for 20 elections. He's never been challenged. He's won in a cakewalk every time. But rumors start circulating in 1866. They grow stronger in 1867. Edward Whelan enters this contest trying to ensure that his old colleague, William Clark, a Clark from Darnley who had moved to St. Peter's Mills, just outside of Morrell, to ensure that he gets elected. Now, just one brief sidebar about how people are elected in this time period dual member ridings, everybody has two votes, and you vote for whoever you want to vote for. So people generally run individually. Conservatives can run against conservatives, liberals against liberals. Uh, it's unusual for two parties to, for two of the candidates to twin themselves. Edward Whelan associates his name with William Clark. He instructs all of his campaign workers and he himself, in his speeches published in the press, says, vote for me, vote for Clark. And they're not worried about the conservatives in this writing. The conservatives are in the language of the Turk nowhere. They're worried about dissident, unhappy liberals, because there's no party whip to make sure that there are only two liberals that run in this riding. There is a horse race for this seat and since no one has to declare their candidacy until the declaration day, which is about a week before the polling day, there are all kinds of rumors about who's going to stand for election. And people can go and be nominated at local meetings that can pass motions that so-and-so be the candidate uh, for their area. But nobody has to officially become a candidate until the declaration day. So there's a lot of jockeying for position, and there's a lot of competition for 
the Catholic Irish vote, which is supposed to be in Edward Whelan's pocket, except that all of a sudden, as if by magic, it's not. So, who are these Irish people? Who is this community that Edward Whelan is said to represent? Well, there are two communities, as I said. There's a community which is the constituency he represents, but Edward Whelan, because he's editor of the Examiner, the mouthpiece for the Liberal Party, and because at this time, Catholic Irish people generally support the Liberal Party as the party of reform, as the party of leaseholders and tenants. It's generally a liberal ethnic group, with significant exceptions. Who are these people? Thanks to Dr. O'Grady, we now know a great deal about who these people are and how the Irish came to Prince Edward Island, because he's cleared up through his research a fog of, of myth and legend and uh, I hope I'm not out of line to say that hopefully in the next year or so you'll be able to purchase this in book form, the fruits of his research. But we know the Irish had started coming out to Prince Edward Island almost as soon as it became a colony of the British. And I'm going to do this super quick. Uh, there's no real pattern to the early emigration. It's the flotsam and jetsam of, of Ireland, uh, government officials, Anglo-Irish, Ulster Irish Protestants, Catholic Irish. Only around 1800 does a pattern emerge, and then you have this steady stream of Irish Catholic immigrants, for the most part, from southeastern Ireland. In 1830, at the cusp of the greatest single phase of emigration to Prince Edward Island, you see a shift in emigration out of Ireland from southeastern Ireland to northern Ireland to the parts of Ireland that we now uh, associate with the Kingdom of Ulster, if not the government or the current kind of playful kind of creation of Ulster. As you know, County Monaghan provided more settlers from Ireland to PI than any other of the counties of Ireland, but large numbers of Irish come out. They're new on the land, they're increasingly poor, they're increasingly either squatters or leaseholders, and they're a volatile element that needs to be studied more in the history of Prince Edward Island. Irish Catholic tenants and squatters are among the great supporters of land reform. That's what led them to the Liberal camp. When the Liberal Party was unable to solve the land question by legislation in 1850s, they had turned, along with many other island tenants, English and Scottish among them, to uh, extra-legal methods, withholding rent in an attempt to force people to sell their estates to them. They, uh, and I, I'm going to come back to this in a moment as one of the factors working against Edward Whelan. But so you have this community of Irish on Prince Edward Island. Many of them are recent emigrants, a generation away from the home country. I don't personally know where the Irish in the area that we're looking at are from. I haven't tried to do a cross-section of their family histories. I think the pattern is not entirely clear. Uh, you have a slight increase in Irish emigration in a, several of these ridings. In most of the ridings, uh, the Irish have been there for a while. And that implies that there's a lot more southern Irish people as a percentage of the population in the settled areas, in the back country at the back of the lot, in the interior of the lot, it'll put the back up, you're going to see a smattering of Irish from different places. I know my, my mother's own people, the Sharpies, were from County Monaghan. They are just outside the boundaries of this you know, riding. But the later you come to Prince Edward Island, the more likely you are to live in the interior unless you stay in an urban area because you take what land is left. And the land that's left is usually the land that's the hardest to reach. And the land that's hardest to reach is usually the furthest from tidewater. And so that's why you find so many Irish people living in the interior of lots along the county lines. And so in this riding, you have 
settled areas. Along this coast, there are places that have been settled since the 1770s and 80s and early in the 1800s. These are islanders. They haven't forgotten their ethnic and religious loyalties, but they are native islanders. But you also have a significant sprinkling of newer immigrants who carry with them their cultural baggage and their loyalties. Now, some of these people are volatile. Some of these people are going to be part of the tenant league. And the tenant league is one of Edward Whalen's problems. I'm not going to focus on William Clark. In the article, we talk about William Clark and who William Clark was and why Whalen was supporting him. But William Clark and Edward Whalen have one thing in common going into the general election of 1867. The by-election never gets called. The government delays, they delay, they delay, and finally they have to call the general election. There are two things in common. They are branded by the younger, more aggressive liberals as old fogies. They are the liberals of the 1850s. They are the liberals of the 1840s. They are the liberals of yesterday. Edward Whalen, at the age of 42, is yesterday's man to some of these people. And he's yesterday's man because he's living on a Prince Edward Island that is moving increasingly to extremism. And Edward Whalen has become, I think, someone, somewhat to his surprise, he has become a moderate. In most climates, being a moderate is a good thing. Being a conciliator is a good thing. When the mood of the people turns to extremes, then you're attacked from both ends at the same time. Edward Whalen has a number of liabilities by 1867 that he did not suffer from until this point in his career. The first liability is one of the political hobby horses of the day. He is, blush, blush, a pro-Confederate. No, he's not supporting the Southern Army in the American Civil War. He is one of the one out of every 100 islanders who is, supports the idea of confederation with the other British North American colonies. Edward Whalen had observed from afar the conference in Charlottetown. He had been named a delegate to the conference in Quebec City. And he came home thinking confederation was a good idea. And he was one of the only people in the Liberal Party that felt that way. In fact, his closest allies were prominent conservatives, some of whom the worst baiters of Catholics, the, the, the worst inciters of religious prejudice that the colony held. So Edward Whalen all of a sudden is being grouped with some pretty unsavory company. William Henry Pope, after all, I hope no one here is related to William Henry Pope, one of the ablest men in Ireland history, but widely reputed to be totally unscrupulous, and took great delight in baiting Catholics all through the 1860s, and he's a pro-Confederate, and Edward Whalen is a pro-Confederate. A lot of Irish are not pro-Confederate. They're not even very pro-British. After all, Britain, as Edward Whalen used to point out when he was a fresh-faced, fiery young newspaper editor, Britain had been oppressing Ireland for centuries with their landocracy, he saw on Prince Edward Island, when he saw the land question on Prince Edward Island, it looked eerily familiar to him. In Ireland, 95% of the land in Ireland was owned by 5% of the people. Many of them absentee landlords, very few of them Catholic Irish, and he comes to Prince Edward Island and finds that a great deal of Prince Edward Island is owned by a handful of large landowners, and he is pretty adamant about it. And now, the British Colonial Office is pressing for confederation. Prince Edward Island sees absolutely nothing in confederation for it. But Edward Whalen does. David Whalen and I have had a, an argument about this. He feels that Edward Whalen is the victim of lack of vision. He said other people had started to imagine Prince Edward Island as an independent colony, standing on its own. Edward Whalen couldn't envision Prince Edward Island on its own. He had to envision it under the protecting wing of someone. And he had envisioned Prince Edward Island under the protecting wing of the British. 
And if the British had been able to solve the land question of Prince Edward Island, he would have been quite happy. But he had given up on Britain because it was the colonial office in Britain that continually thwarted Islanders' attempts to get rid of these evil absentee landlords, and I am now using their words, not my historical analysis, because I don't think in terms of black and white. He's exchanged Britain for Canada, because even though Canada has never been able to make, or a British North America, even though the projected confederation does not promise to solve the land question, Edward Whalen is confident that it will, that by enlarging the boundaries of Prince Edward Island life, that Prince Edward Island would acquire the means to get rid of their absentee landlords, and they would acquire something else which he thought the island was lacking, and that was a sense of perspective and broader horizons. He thought Prince Edward Island had become, if it not already was, a small, mean, parochial place. This is a father chiding his children, but you know what? When children get to be uh, teenagers, they don't take to that very well, and they didn't take to being scolded by Edward Whalen about that sort of thing. So Edward Whalen is a known confederate. It's not like being a child molester, but it makes you pretty unpopular in Prince Edward Island. It erodes some of his, the goodwill he's built up, and he has other problems for another He's condemned the Fenians. Now, I don't know if you remember the Fenians, but in the mid-1860s, Irish Americans, uh, I don't want to oversimplify this too much, but it's easier to do it this way, Irish Americans, sympathetic with Fenian rebels in Ireland, conceived of a plan basically to invade Canada and hold it ransom to force the British to set Ireland free, or to at least hold part of Canada for ransom and at least cause trouble. So Irish American ex-Civil War soldiers were massing on the borders of New Brunswick and Ontario, threatening to invade, and there was a lot, there was a big buzz of support for them on Prince Edward Island, apparently, because this is the sort of thing that doesn't get written down, apparently among particularly the Irish. And Edward Whalen who had been a revolutionary of sorts in his youth, had become a constitutional liberal. He did not believe in violent overthrow. He believed in the freedom of Ireland, but by constitutional means. And he condemned the Fenians outright in his newspaper, ridiculed them, and mocked them. Quite frankly, you could easily mock the Fenians. They were one of the most incompetent groups in the history of warfare in North America, which is unfortunate since they were all trained to fight in the Civil War and should have known better. But having seen the gangs of New York, maybe I begin to understand why some of them weren't very good soldiers. So that makes them unpopular. Not only that, Edward Whalen has condemned the Tenant League, and this is where I want to talk about that climate of extremism. In the uh, official mind in Charlottetown, the Fenians are associated with the Tenant League, and the Tenant League is an illegal organization of the tenantry of Prince Edward Island, numbering as many as 10,000 people in a population of only 80 or 90,000, dedicated to forcing the landlords to liquidate their estates by selling it to the tenantry by withholding their rents, which is illegal. The power of the law is behind rent collection because the power of British law has always protected the rights of property. I say this with a lawyer at the back, and the, uh, I think that's right. Now, if the Tenant League had favored passive resistance, maybe Edward Whalen would not have taken such a stand against them, but passive resistance had turned to violence, and there had been mob scenes on the roads of rural PEI, and there had been violence, and British troops had had to be called in to enforce the collection of rent. And the Tenant League had crumbled away at this show of force, but the Tenant Leaguers were still out there, and they were still angry, and Edward Whalen had condemned their extremism. Many Tenant Leaguers were liberals, and Edward Whalen has become unpopular with them. 
That's three strikes. Usually you're out after three strikes. Edward Whalen had a fourth strike against him. The fourth strike was innuendo. The fourth strike was innuendo and rumor. The rumor began to circulate in 1866. The rumor increased in virulence as the election campaign wore on, and it was the Robert Harris, when he was still living in PEI, looking very much a prince of the church. As bishop, he was bishop of Charlottetown for three decades. He was a remarkable leader. He was a very iron-willed bishop. Even his admirers admitted that uh, there's nothing he liked better than to get his own way, and he was known to rejoice in the discomfiture of his enemies. Bishop McIntyre was also uh, an ultramontanist. He believed in um, the church being active, and he was active in the political arena, trying to achieve what he felt sincerely was equality of rights for Catholics. The form that generally took was the endowment of, by government of a separate school system on Prince Edward Island for Catholics. Edward Whalen in The Examiner had been a defender of the Catholic faith when William Henry Pope had attacked it, had ridiculed Catholic beliefs as superstitions, had ridiculed. There's a great series of arguments about the Jesuits and the perfidies they supposedly had done in the history of Europe. Edward Whalen had provided a forum for Catholic sympathizers, but he was not a Catholic first. As religious warfare, just as with the land system, as religious warfare moved towards extremes of words, if not in deeds, in the 1860s, the bishop appeared to have found Edward Whalen insufficiently Catholic. And so the bishop had reputedly found it, paid for the creation of a newspaper called The Vindicator, whose editor was very much uh, the bishop's man, a fellow named Edward Riley. Edward Riley, a very ambitious, a very young, very capable young journalist, been trained actually with Edward Whalen. It was okay, I think, with Edward Whalen if the bishop no longer chose to use the columns of the examiner through his proxies, Father Angus you know, MacDonald, the rector of the Catholic school, for example. I think that was okay with Edward Whalen, and it was okay with Islanders, but the rumor had started to circulate that not only was the bishop unhappy with Edward Whalen, but Edward Whalen had become, had lapsed somewhat. Father Macmillan in the history of the Catholic Church and P.I., he's so delicate with some things. And uh, he, he says the rumor had spread on, on one, I, I may have, a rumor to his inner that Mr. Whalen had grown somewhat indifferent in matters of faith and had been for a time utterly neglectful with regard to the practices of his religion, for which reason it was said he no longer possessed the friendship and favor of his spiritual superiors. Meaning, he had fallen out with the bishop, possibly because he was not being a good Catholic. There are a lot of unknowns here. When Edward Whalen died, one of his obituaries observed that he was a fast liver. And I don't think that meant he ran quickly. And that fast livers did not usually attain to patriarchal age. There's an implication there that Edward Whalen was intemperate, in other words. Uh, that he may have been a little bit of a party boy and that may have not sat well with the bishop. Edward Whalen had friends and supporters, though, among the clergy on Prince Edward Island. One of them had been the pastor at St. Peter's. Now, you have to remember, 
Where is Bishop McIntyre from? Cable Head. This is his home parish. He not only takes an interest in his home parish, he takes such an interest in it, he won't even appoint a permanent pastor for it. He appoints temporary pastors and he keeps moving them around. And if you saw the correspondence about the construction of the new church in St. Peter's, you would see that the bishop took quite an interest in that as well and wasn't very pleased when the brick that was used was inferior and there were problems, or the, at least the construction was inferior. Anyway, the pastor at the bay had been a friend and confidant of Edward Whalen's and mysteriously, it was said, not coincidentally, he was replaced by Reverend James Phelan. This was Ronald B. McDonald. Ronald McDonald, I think, R.B. McDonald, I think, was the pastor. Why is this significant? Well, Reverend Phelan was a vocal and active supporter of one of the rumored candidates for the seat in Second Kings, a fellow by the name of Edward Riley. So Edward Riley was, I think, I, well, to me, Edward Riley wanted to be Edward Whalen. He was a young, ambitious, talented, Irish, Roman, Catholic newspaper man, and he wanted Edward Whalen's status, and he wanted the loyalty of the constituency that Edward Whalen had controlled, which was the Catholic Irish vote. And it's, if you read this, you know, the correspondence here, and I don't want to go on too much longer, but if you read the correspondence, uh, Edward Whalen begins by saying that he will just go talk to the bishop and the bishop will squelch a couple of candidates that are planning to run in the next election. And then Edward Riley's name starts appearing and Edward Whalen refers to him as that brat, Riley. I received a missive from that brat, Riley, asking, oh, telling me, Mr. Clark, that you're going to leave me in the lurch. And I don't believe it for a minute. Edward Riley sets aim or takes aim at William Clark, but his real target, I think, is Edward Whalen. So Edward Whalen is very much on the outs with his party. You can see it in the editorials he publishes in the paper. He's very much been marginalized. Here's this person who is central to the Liberal Party all through the 50s and the first part of the 60s, who because of the positions he's taken on public issues, several of the key key issues of the day has been marginalized among the constituency that he enjoyed and whose the last straw it seems is that the rumor is spreading that he no longer enjoys the confidence of the bishop that the bishop is in fact supporting Edward Riley and there's no evidence of this because that's not the sort of thing that gets written down but Edward Whalen certainly believed it Edward Riley is very circumspect in his newspaper at this time is called the Herald because the Vindicator went out of business because it lost a libel suit uh, because it was somewhat intemperate in some of its accusations. And the Herald is very neutral about Edward Whalen and he publishes a newspaper editorial said, well, you think that a person like Edward Whalen would be trying to help out uh, an aspiring young Catholic fellow like Edward Riley instead of opposing him with this had William Clark. Whalen is not well. We don't know why he's not well. He complains in his letters of having a heavy cold. His handling of the campaign, difficult to know whether his strategy was correct. He was not active in canvassing. He was too busy. He's trying to make a living. The election is held. The conservatives are smashed. The Liberals triumphantly come back into office. William Clark is elected. Edward Whalen is elected. Although his majority has been reduced significantly, Edward Riley runs a strong third. After flirting with running right up until the last moment before he confirmed he would be a candidate. Now, the story should have ended there, but of course, in the politics of the 1860s, stories don't end there because Edward Whalen, when the Liberals are in power, occupies a very lucrative post king or queen's printer and it's a lucrative post because the queen's printer has the contract for printing all of the legislation 
all of the laws that the government passes, printing government announcements, and also the Hansard. There's a little problem with this, though. In, uh, I forget when they changed this, but well into the 1900s, any person elected to office in the British Empire, if they accepted, if they were elected to the legislature, if they accepted a paid office in government, they had to resign and seek re-election because they had to go back to their voters and say, listen, I changed my job. Do you still want me to represent you? Usually this is a rubber stamp. George Coles becomes premier, and I forget, attorney general perhaps, and he has to resign as premier and seek re-election, and he wins by an overwhelming majority in the Fort Augustus area, um, like 25 votes against him or something like that. I forget the figure. William Clark is appointed collector of the customs you know, department, and... Uh, he would have to run and seek re-election, except that William Clark, that's what he was looking for anyway, so when he got his appointment with the government, he decided he wouldn't offer for re-election, because he didn't have to be in the legislature to be the collector of customs, but he had paid his dues, his political dues, so he simply resigned. But of course, Edward Whalen wasn't about to resign, wasn't about to give in to his enemies, and he had to stand for re-election, and this time, Edward Riley targets him directly. This time, the rumor mill is geared up to full speed. And this time, to Edward Whalen's bitter shock, he loses. He loses by 31 votes. And I don't think you can read this. I made this overhead. If I had more time, if I had made more time for myself, I would have talked about electioneering on Prince Edward Island in the 1860s. Fabulous topic. You think elections are fun now. But this is uh, Charlottetown, 1870s. Uh, that's the courthouse, and this is the crowd gathered for election day. Remember, no secret ballot. You stand up and declare your vote in front of your fellows, which my father declared a couple of weeks ago. He thought they should still do that today. Um, I explained to him why it was considered bad form, or why they changed it, because there's a great deal of um, pressure exerted. This is another sketch by Robert Harris. Uh, I think you can see everything here except somebody with a bottle. There's a guy there who's being brought reluctantly up to the hustings, and there are people haranguing other people. People are counting uh, potential votes. People are being bribed. People are being threatened. We don't have time to get into that. That doesn't happen today, right? <laughs> we collect a lot of good stories about electioneering, and one that I've heard several times, but it's still a favorite because it obviously happened all over the place, was with secret ballot. One of the things about the secret ballot, uh, God, long time, is that um, Islanders apparently, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a secret ballot. No one's supposed to know how you vote, but when Islanders sold their vote, the evidence seems to show that they were surprisingly honorable. That if someone paid you to vote liberal, you actually went in and voted liberal. But on occasion, uh, depending upon the reliability of the person being bribed, they couldn't trust them to vote the right way, so they paid them to stay home. <laughs> Which uh, worked just as well. Anyway, um, different pressures applied. Different pressures applied. This is, I don't know if you can read this, the election in the uh, second district of Kings County, and you can't really make it up. We have no reliable count of the exact uh, votes for the above uh, district. The sheriff expressed the, uh, the examines his poll book at Georgetown today. Uh, of all we can learn, Mr. Leo and appears lost the election by a small number of about 30 votes. He and his friends were too sanguine of success and made scarcely any efforts to secure his election while his opponents were laboring day and night and won greatly to their disgrace freely used names which ought to have been kept from the public i.e. the bishop wants 
As to this, the intimidation which was used at two polling places, especially the legal vote and all the divisions, these are the usual, that's your stop and trade attack if you lose. Um, although there may be some little irritation in the seat at an election contest, Mr. Whelan is not rejecting out of the House at present after 21 years' membership, during which time he had pretty, a pretty good share of work at the laboring or it is only just and reasonable that he should be relieved for a while and he, he treats that others will do more bravely and more satisfactorily for the interest. In other words, uh, those grapes were sour anyway. <laughs> but that's not really true. Edward Whalen was, according to folklore, crushed by the defeat. J.C. McMillan, uh, who wrote, in many ways, an astonishing history of the Catholic Church on Prince Edward Island, he does tend to cast all of history as a morality tale, with the Catholics usually coming out on top. Uh, you know, he broke your jaw, but he hurt his hand doing it, that sort of thing. It was a sad, it was, yes, it was a sad and it was a bitter blow for him. It was said indeed that he never recovered from it. Those who saw him on his return to Charlottetown after the campaign told how he had aged in a few short weeks so that he appeared little more than a wreck of his former self. His step had lost its sprightliness and as he moved about he seemed as if uncertain of his strength. He had been the welcome visitor at so many homes and boon companion, read between the lines here, of so many friends, seemed to have lost all interest in social gatherings while the sprightly wit and rich repartee that had adorned his conversation gave way to a settled and somber taciturnity. People felt he had died of rejection, he had died of a broken heart. I don't think Edward Whalen died of a broken heart. He actually offered, Edward Riley wins the election, but Edward Riley won't take the position of Queen's printer. Because if he does, he has to resign, and he has to stand for election. And Edward Whalen says, bring it on, sonny boy. And Edward Riley says, I think I'll retire from politics for, no, I'll say in politics. And Edward Whalen retains the printership, Queen's printership. I think what's happening is that even in the winter of 1867, Edward Whalen is ill with what is going to become a fatal illness. And medical knowledge of the day, his official cause of death is given as dropsy, but I think that's more a symptom. The retention, Catherine's nodding here, thank you. It's more a symptom of an illness. Uh, he's retaining water. He's retaining the fluid. Yeah. I mean, my mother-in-law retained, oops, sorry, um, uh, children of dropsy. Um, but this is part of the romantic image. Here is this incredible, charismatic, magnetic, the best journalist, the best orator, one of the ablest politicians of the day, rejected at the poll, victim of a slander that he himself had something to say about it in the newspaper, although he was embarrassed. He said, I don't have more to say about it. So I didn't get to it. How often blooms his beauty? There is a tragedy here, whether or not he was killed. Was he rejected by the Irish community on Prince Edward Island? It's difficult to say because if he had lived to contest the next election, who's to say how he might have valued his forces? Fighter. He was always known as a fighter. The reason he's a broken man is not because of defeat. He's a broken man because his health is broken. I think. Edward Whalen would probably have lived to fight another day. He might well have lived to win back the voters who had turned their backs on him. Not all of whom were Irish Catholic voters in his rival. The Fenian scare would pass and they would become the object of buffoonery and mockery in history. The tenant league would pass, 
And all of them eventually loaned just of around eight hundred thousand dollars when they joined Confederation in eighteen seventy three to buy up the absentee landlords and Edward Rowland was right. So what would happen? Confederation would come to pass. Whether Edward Wayne Wilson would be But Edward Whalen would not be around to see this because he died within months of this election. Edward Whalen passes into romantic cycle. If he lived to be 90, he wouldn't be as famous as he is today. <laughs> anyway, that's my way of getting around providing a definitive answer to the question of whether it was a love gone bad. Edward Riley, Edward Whalen felt hard done by. Edward Whalen did feel that he had been betrayed, but not betrayed by Irish Catholic voters, betrayed by his political colleagues who didn't stick up for him, who didn't stand by him when the fickle crowd turned against him. I've gone a little over time, and I'm sorry for that. That's what happens when you're not as ready as you should be. You're not as concise. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> and I think I broke the podium. I will, if you have any questions, I'll be quite happy to try to answer them or pass them on to Dr. Brady. <laughs> well, what time Production of what appears to be a portrait, and I know I never came from. Sorry, Catherine. Um, you know, he was a, a character, a brilliant man, a very politician, but he was not constrained by the political system of today that he is only person. Would he have been that person in today's political It is, actually, I just some examples of his wit, and I maybe should have left those in and cut out some of my own wit, because uh, would have been everybody has had his own speeches on the presentation of the president. Could be possible like the champagne before us, bright, sparkling, and zoom, so. <laughs> you know, um, the, he has, I can't remember if I can find this, uh, Someone sends him a letter asking him if he'll take his son on at his printing shop. And uh, oh, he can, uh, if he has anything up 
civilized look about him is not quite a dwarf, not yet a giant, as you know, the bee from a bull's foot. If he's not in rags, has you know, good appetite, if he will only short be a disgrace to my very respectable clients, I'll take good care of him. I mean, how's that for a high level? I mean, he obviously was extremely popular. He was not just made the other day. The party system, there's no party yet to model. And so he would have been needed, I think, somewhat in the political system of the modern era. I think he would still have stood out as Bill Sparkle, but he might have had to be more circumspect. Whether or not he would have stood for election is a good question as well. I don't know. Can you have a little bit of time for this picture? Uh, there is a dictionary of uh, you know, biographies of Canadian figures uh, beginning at the publication began in the 1970s and Ian Ross Robertson in I think volume 9 of this called the DCD published an excellent short piece well short piece it's a long essay for you know, the dictionary, it's about five or 10,000 words. That's the best piece I've seen on Whalen. Peter McCourt gathered together a collection of speeches by Culling the Hansard and Culling the Council speeches that he gave from the examiner. And he included a biographical sketch, but there's so much mythology and legend about his early life and that Joseph Howe sent him to Prince Edward Island because island reformers asked him to send them a newspaper man because they needed a reform organ, all of which appears to be apocrypha. Uh, there's nothing that, as well, I mean, he had more admirers after he died than he did alive. Isn't that usually the way of it? Uh, so there's no biography other than something back by McCord. P.C. Harvey did an article on Edward Whalen in the period between the wars which has some very good anecdotal material because he could talk to people that, you know, remembered him. That's where I got that quote about the, the you know, young boy that wanted to work at the paper. Uh, there be, could be more work done. Darren? Do you think, though, that, that you think if there was a single issue that turned a voters against Whalen that was in pro of the status? You know, there's been a tendency uh, in the kind of kind of you know historiography of PEI. Father Bolger set a kind of a template for discussion of island history with his account of the island and that issue of confederation. Ian you know, Robertson came along not long afterwards and in a much less well-known work because it's an MA thesis basically says, you know, confederation is not the only issue that was going on in Prince Edward Island. The island was riven by disputes about education and religion, and uh, that's true. But I think what's happening is you get this kind of a dialectic going, is that it turns out, if you read the newspapers, that Confederation in 1866-67 was a hot topic. Any political meeting, any gathering, you had to take a stand. And they would have meetings in the wintertime uh, to have a debate about the Confederation issue. The only reason the issue died was that there weren't enough people to speak in favor of, of the Union. So I think his being a Confederate, he did issue in his electoral card, he promised that he would not take any action or not vote for Confederation unless the constituents of his riding instructed him to do so. And uh, that was fairly typical of the kind of pledge that the voters were making their candidates give because they didn't want to elect somebody and then find three months later they turn around and vote for confederation. Um, so he had promised in a guarded way to be reticent on it. So I, it, it is a combination of things that pulls Whalen down. That may be the biggest drag. But the whole business of his personal morality and his second marriage appears to have happened outside of the church as well. The whole question of his personal morality, I mean, P.I. is an island of gossip, right? <laughs> How he survived since they've canceled the party line, I don't know. Uh, but it's an, island, it's an island of gossip. 
And that whisper campaign would have been very damaging to him because he's a hero to people and to to believe that your hero has feet of clay is, is, is damaging taken when he's already off his balance, off balance because of these other things. We live in a world that penalizes substance and rewards appearance, uh, particularly in politics. And Wayland would have appealed on that front, so the fact that he had an intellect wouldn't have hurt him either, but he would have come across well. You know, like Pierre Trudeau got elected, and he had some pretty strong opinions and continued to hold them whether you agree with them or not. And he was pretty unpopular in some parts of Canada, but now that he's dead, he's a great hero too. Um, I think he would have done well. I agree with you, Dan. Any other questions? Yes? Until Jim Lee, there was, that they were the only two that had been actually elected. elected. Right. And Oban as well, we had an Acadian premier, his name was Oban Arsenal, who was also uh, appointed by caucus, elected by caucus as premier, and the first time he went to the polls, he lost as well. Now, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that they lost in the election because of their religion. Macmillan, I mean, the conservatives were absolutely wiped out in that election, and it was largely because of the you know, depression and maybe because Macmillan was too clever for his own good um, in terms of winning the debates but losing the wars. Uh, Oban Arsenault, it, very difficult. That was also an unsettled time on Prince Edward Island. There's a lot of inflation. Um, the Conservatives have been in power for a while and were tired. Uh, Campbell, when he became Premier, I mean, the Conservatives were on the upswing and the Liberals were obviously on the way out. And even Bennett Campbell was aware of that from you know, what I'm told. That wouldn't, that wouldn't have helped Oban Arsenal either. Although he was very cosmopolitan, extremely erudite, you know, worked as a barrister in London. I only have a question, I'm sorry. Um, do you think that Wayland appeared to be, from the article that I read, um, do you have an accent? Well, The David McDonald there. syndrome. Yeah. Yes, they were there. They were there not for history. They're not even there not. They just simply would not. They love it. Yeah, I think he. I think there's a certain amount. I think of a kind of pride, excessive pride, like. I said in the, in the introduction to the article that not only was it tragedy, it was Greek tragedy because he was guilty, I think, of a kind of hubris where he really didn't think, he didn't really want to concede that he might be in trouble in the riding, and he really did have a tendency to take for granted that these people saw the real Edward Whale and, and they wouldn't listen to the whispers and that they would vote for him despite Confederation, despite the Tenant League, despite the Fenians, despite Bishop... McIntyre supposedly being opposed to him. Now, Reverend Phelan apparently openly canvassed for Riley, but whether he did so on the orders of the bishop is not proven, and the, I think the bishop is drawn into it by the fact that he made this switch at a critical time, moved this priest out who was you know, a Whalen man and replaced him with a Riley man. Um, not the Raleigh man, but the Raleigh man. <laughs> so that is definitely, definitely, I think, Darren, an excellent point. And it, it, it helps make it more of a tragedy. I'd only taken it more seriously. But I think he was unwell also. He really was unwell. I mean, Whalen is, 
a fascinating character. This whole period in Ireland history is fascinating. I've been spending all of my time in recent years in the 1900s. Uh, but this period in Ireland history, not only is it the only time Canadians write about our history, because it's the only time that we matter, is this confederation story, but it's also the period when the small island view of history, the David Wheel and the Bagwell view of history, uh, it's also the time when we are in our golden age. And Whalen and Coles are giants in part because they are leading figures during our golden age. Had they been prominent in the 1920s? Can anybody tell me who the premiers were in the 1920s? Probably some if you can. Yeah. He lost in 1919. Bell, whose biggest uh, you know, achievement was that he would go for midnight rambles despite being 73 years old because he had lots of energy. <laughs> Struck by a car and killed, actually, after he retired. Not in Charlottetown. <laughs> J.D. Stewart, fine premier, shrewd politician. Went a little wonky on the prohibition thing and got thrown out of office for a while. Um, Saunders. Who are these guys? I don't mean to slight them, but Coles and Whalen stand out, not necessarily because they're intellectual giants or that they make history, but they also are figures at a very important time in their history. And that, in fact, goes back to that old argument about, you know, do the times make the man or does the man make the times? Or woman, as the case might be. I have the same problem. Andre McDonald deserves better. Yeah, I think he has a little park named after him in Georgetown. But that's another lecture. That's for the uh, Scottish Heritage Society. <laughs> anyway, perhaps you'll. All right. <laughs> So, uh, on behalf of everyone here, I want to thank Dr. Red for his uh, for his great talk here tonight. Um, Edward Whalen is uh, very important to the society here. He, he is a past president, um, and if not for fate, we might have some information about him, uh, you know, in our minutes, be, uh, because he was uh, I think it was back in in the uh, early. 1860s that he was president. Unfortunately, we, we lost our minutes uh, prior to 1870 in a fire in around 1950 in the, in the building we were in at that time, or, or we would at least have that as a, as a source to refer to. And I understand that's what happened to much of his, his personal uh, correspondence and so on. But I'll tell you one other little story or anecdote uh, about Edward Whale, and this happened not too long ago, about 23 years ago. Actually, when uh, we've, uh, I first joined the, the society, there were seven or eight of us coming in that night, and um, Wolf Smith Sr., I think, was present at the time, and uh, Wolf McAleer was another big name at, in the society at that time. And these guys were always out for a joke or something like that. You know, they're always putting someone on. And so they had seven or eight new members coming in. And uh, uh, Wolf Smith uh, asked for the, uh, uh, asked Wolf McAleer if he'd give a report on the whale and grave. And us new members were sitting there and we're looking at each other, what's, what's this whale and grave situation? Anyway, Wolf McAleer gets up and, and he simply says, the last time the committee checked the grave, it was still whaling. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we only found out later that, in fact, the, so the society did have a, a whaling grave committee and its, uh, its responsibility was to check out the grave from time to time and make sure that it was reasonably well kept and do some landscaping and so on. So that's uh, that's the way of engraved. We we had all kinds of uh, uh, out in a graveyard by uh, Birchwood Birchwood High School. Yeah. So we should 
uh, from time to time check that out and see if it needs some more landscaping see and so on. And see if it's still whaling well and give a report on it for the next next monthly meeting. How many problems, George? Pardon? Was that hollow that burned down on the grass and trees? Was that not called whaling hollow? Uh, that one building? Probably uh, Dr. O'Grady or someone might be able to, to answer that better than myself. I'm not sure where it was. Nine, around 1950, just before they built uh, the new one on Grafton oh, Street. I understand it's quite a, quite a big fire, yeah. So we're just too young to remember Too young, too young, just, just, yeah, we, we bit of a gaffer, yeah, that's true. Um, anyhow, thanks again uh, for, for uh, that very interesting uh, lecture. And if anyone, I'll reiterate what Dr. Red said before, if anyone of you have anything that has to do with Edward Whale or know of someone who has anything, a letter, correspondence, anything at all, uh, to bring it forward to, to Dr. Ed and, so that a copy of it can be made and, and can be preserved and we learn something more about, about this fascinating gentleman. So with that, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll mention that, that John Cousins is going to be with us next week and he's going to be talking on uh, the worthy heirs of Larry Gorman, uh, the folk song writing tradition in West Prince County. And if any of you who've uh, seen or heard uh, uh, John Cousins speak uh, before, you'll be sure to be back here next week. Tremendously interesting gentleman, knows an awful lot of history, particularly of West Prince County, knows a lot about the folklore and people and stories and anecdotes of that area as well. So it should be should be very interesting. So I'll leave you with that and uh, please if you have time stick around we have some sandwiches and cookies and coffee so uh, mix and mingle have a bite to eat and talk and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks for coming.